Good morning. Um, welcome to today's view on Africa briefing on the electoral situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo. My name is Stephanie Walters. I'm the head of the Conflict Prevention and Risk Analysis Division, and I'm also focused on uh, Central Africa and the DRC in particular. And this briefing today follows a two-week field visit to Kinshasa, which uh, ended last week. Um, I'm going to very briefly give an overview of the key players um, and their positions on the elections. Um, and then um, end with some recommendations and then um, allow you to ask hopefully many questions. Um, so without further ado, um, as many of you will know, the deadline for the um, presidential elections in the DRC are, is November uh, this year. Um, according to the constitution, the elections have to take place at the latest by mid-November. Now we've been in this um, space of trying to figure out whether these elections will take place um, when they will take place for about two years now. There are a number of key issues that have prevented clarity on this question. The, the primary one is whether Joseph Kabila uh, will stand for another mandate, which he is not allowed to do according to the constitution uh, that was adopted in 2005. That question still has not been resolved. Um, the second question is um, a question of whether or not these elections can now in fact be held. The Independent Electoral Commission came out with an electoral calendar last year, um, which indicated that it wanted to hold three separate rounds of elections, starting with local elections, which have never taken place, followed by provincial elections, and then culminating in presidential elections in November. Um, it was quite clear um, when this calendar was initially re released that in order to organize all of those elections, a lot of logistics would have to be uh, uh, put in place, a lot of funding would have to be put in place, and there have been endless delays really since then. Um, if you speak with people on the ground in the DRC who are involved with elections, many of them will tell you that the Independent Electoral Commission has not attempted to reach any of those deadlines. Now, there are a number of different political interferences that have happened since then, which I won't go into. I'm happy to uh, ask questions about those. As things stand right now, there have been none of the elections that are due to take place in 2016. We are now focused, and this briefing is focused, on the presidential election, which, as I said, is due to take place in November. The latest information that we have from the Independent Electoral Commission is that there now needs to be a, re a review of the voter registration rolls. Now, this is an issue that is new. It's been uh, on the cards as a key um, um, element of, of free and transparent elections since the last elections were held in 2011. But the, the, the new timeline that has been given by the Independent Electoral Commission is, in fact, very surprising. It was announced in January that this 18-month period would be necessary. It was announced at the same time that a new electoral law would have to be reviewed when Parliament returned in March. And so essentially what it has done is de facto delayed the election until sometime in 2017. Now, some additional facts on this particular question of the voter registration. Um, the last time that the voter registration was reviewed was in um, 2011, when the last elections were held. And in fact, they were able to do it in three months. Um, the other interesting fact about this is that the Independent Electoral Commission had actually already put out to tender or a request for tenders on the review of the voter registration lists in which itself it itself had indicated that it should take no longer than three to four months. A final fact is the um, organize, International Organization of the Francophonie, which did an audit of the electoral system um, last year and of the requirements for elections, also indicated that a period of four months should be sufficient for a review of the voter registration lists, which means that we wonder why suddenly it's due to take 18 months. Um, clearly, in the context which I briefly described at the beginning, it's being interpreted by many as an attempt to prolong Joseph Kabila's mandate, to perhaps try and institute to institute a transition period um, and to generally just play with the electoral time frame. So it has not been received um, with much um, with much approval from the by the key by the key players. Now the Congolese government's position on on this whole question is essentially that it is a tall order to order elect, organize elections in the DRC. The Independent Electoral Commission has been trying as hard as, it's, as it can. Um, it will counter um, accusations that it is trying to delay the process by saying, well, 
don't we need a, 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 an updated and transparent voter registration list? Um, it will argue about the unconstitutionality of it by invoking Article 70 of the Constitution, which says that the president remains in office until an, he is replaced by an elected president. So they have come up with a number of different arguments with which they counter the suggestion that this is a politically motivated delay rather than a technical delay. Um, the opposition, uh, I'll talk about three of the big opposition groupings, the G7, the Dynamique de l'Opposition, and then the UDPS. Um, all have uh, uh, the same view on the election process. Uh, in other words, this has, these presidential elections have to take place by November, otherwise we are in breach of the Constitution and, 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 and we have to come up with another arrangement. Um, they have reacted somewhat differently to the government's proposal of a dialogue. Um, this is something that the government came up with already last year. It's a very tried and not necessarily tested, but tried um, 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 approach that the Congolese government often uses when there are big political issues to be resolved. The problem is that inevitably the Congolese government organizes the event and then stage manages it and so it lacks credibility from the get-go and often doesn't get the participation of the key political players or the key civil society players and that again is repeated now. So this forum, this forum that has been this, that has been proposed, this dialogue that has been proposed by the government to try and address this issue of election delays has been rejected by the opposition on two grounds. One is uh, you haven't consulted us on the agenda, and two is you're asking us to talk about an issue that you have created, that you have orchestrated. In other words, the delay. So there's not a lot of movement on the dialogue. Now the government has tried to, to influence the different factions of the, of, of the opposition to come to the negotiating table to try and lend credibility to the process. So for a long time it was lobbying uh, Congo's oldest uh, political opposition, the UDPS, which is split um, into two, two separate camps to participate, but the bottom line is um, that the UDPS will not be attending this dialogue either. The Dynamique de l'Opposition, which is uh, a grouping of some of the groups, Vital Camere, Martin Fayulu, uh, Joseph Olenga Koy, some of the key names in political opposition in the DRC, has also said no to the dialogue. The G7, which is the, the group of political parties that left the, the, um, Congolese, the, the presidential majority alliance, um, um, that has been running the country, so the, from which the president hails. Um, this G7 left that, that uh, majority alliance in the middle of last year, and their stance on dialogue is also there is no need for it because we have a constitution that tells us when we need to have elections. That's just a quick overview. I'll return to the dialogue later when I talk about the African Union, um, which has now also jumped into the, into the mix on that particular issue. But unanimously, the view is these elections have to take place in November. Civil society, which is a, is a relatively new player and, and an increasingly important player on the political scene, um, is also very much opposed to this delay, has similar interpretations about why this delay, how it has come about, and the fact that it is politically motivated. Now we have um, um, two key players in civil society, Filimbi and La Lucha, who were very um, uh, instrumental in organizing the protests in January last year. Uh, against the um, electoral code that had been introduced then, which um, had mandated that there have to, had to be a census, which at the time was also interpreted as an attempt to delay the election, and which then prompted days and days of um, protest in Kinshasa, and then um, a retraction of that element of the law. And that is really the first time that we have seen La Lucha and Filimbi play such an important role. Um, and they are largely youth driven civil society organizations with very strong youth leaders. Um, some have a greater presence in Kinshasa, other have a greater greater presence in, in Eastern DRC. A number of their leaders remain in prison as a result of the uh, protests that were held last year. Um, and, and so um, there, there's, there's still an issue there. But those are very prominent civil society organizations, which have now um, uh, um, taken a very leading role and and which do have a slightly in fact a very different dynamic to the political opposition which many people see as sort of outdated um, old leaders um, who tend to have the similar approach to politician politics in Congo um, politicians don't always have the greatest reputation and so the civil society dynamic is a new one and is thought to be much more sincere and perhaps much more forceful um, but on the key issue of elections they are aligned with the views of, of the political opposition um, the, the population in the DRC, 
I mentioned briefly the uh, protests that we saw in January last year. This was really a watershed um, moment. They took place in Kinshasa uh, over several days, but also in Bukavu and in Goma and to a smaller extent in Lubumbashi. Um, and they were very significant in, because they had these kinds of street protests hadn't taken place in, in about three decades. So we haven't seen that um, happen in, in the DRC in the post Mobutu era. era. Um, and this population, in, in, at the time of the protests last year, you know, was faced with, a, with, with the police shooting at them. There were injuries, there were arrests, um, there were people dragged off the streets. So there was a high cost at that time of participating in those protests. There have been ongoing protests um, since then. Um, let me just take a short technical break. Are we okay with everything? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'm just seeing questions coming here. Um, and so there has been a pre pressure has been maintained on the government uh, around this issue of the elections. And I think that what happened in January last year, I wouldn't say changed the calculation of the government, but certainly did um, make them realize that trying to go get away with extending the mandate wasn't going to be as easy as they may initially have thought. Now, while I was in Kinshasa, there was a, um, a call for a stay away um, by the opposition parties, by the dynamique de, de l'opposition. And in a city of about 10 million people, it's hard to know exactly how many, I, I, I can say that that was largely a success. People stayed away from work, businesses were closed, downtown Kinshasa, which is a very bustling place, was largely empty. The government tried very hard to counter uh, the efforts of the opposition, forcing, of course, civil servants to, to come to work and trying to act as though it was business as usual, but they were unable to really convince anybody. Kinshasa was a different city that day um, and people did stay at home. Now, um, it is a little bit of a battle who, who won. Was the Ville Morte a success? Wasn't it a success? I would argue that it was. Um, did the population all stay at home because they wanted to, because they were heeding the words of the, of the opposition? I think probably not. I think many people stayed home because they were also afraid. But I think that there's a general sense that people understood that this was an oppos a political um, manifestation and that they did support that. Um, there were no clashes with the police. The police was out in force, um, and there were no clashes with the police, which was which was positive from both sides, both in terms of the police being able to maintain some kind of calm and not engaging deliberately in, in confrontation with the population, but also because the political opposition had made it very clear, we are not going out to loot. We are going, we are making a quiet statement about what we see happening in our country. And I would, I would say that that was a very big success. And again, another very strong mis message to the government. Now, the international community, um, we, we've seen statements come out from the U.S. Special Envoy in particular very clearly for at least two years now against a mandate extension. That is, statements that have been made similarly in, in Rwanda and in Burundi to a lesser extent on Congo Brazzaville. No mandate extension. Now, that, that message is loud and clear. It hasn't vacillated. The U.S. has gone as far farther than anybody even mooting the idea of potentially imposing sanctions on some of the key players. That was something that happened earlier this year, and I think um, they've been very forthright about that. Um, the UN, the AU, the um, Organization of the Francophonie, and the EU put out a statement somewhat ill-timed, I would argue, um, on the eve, the evening of the Villemort, supporting the idea of dialogue. Um, this was viewed by different parties in different ways. It also talked about holding elections within the delay, the constitutional delays, rather than spe speaking about a particular date. So the government interpreted that. Um, the government said this gives us wiggle room. The international community is acknowledging that we need wiggle room. The opposition um, sort of said, we 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 see the reference to constitutional delays, and so we see it supporting our side. But it was a it was a vague statement, and it, it wasn't a very effective way of communicating whatever stance they were in fact trying to communicate. It was a bit unfortunate. Um, members of the opposition did feel that it was um, it, it sort of diminished the impact of the of the stay away um, to have even to not have spoken clearly about the actual date that the presidential election should take place and more importantly that there was no mention of the, the ongoing abuse of human rights. Um, during the week leading up to the, the stay away there were arrests and harassments of opposition politicians. The day of the stay away that stay away. There were arrests in particular in, in the eastern DRC. Um, the Lucha, La Lucha um, activists were arrested and have now been found guilty of, of undermining state security, which is, you know, it's, it's a trumped up charge. They were holding some signs. Um, so there was a sense that the international community, that that statement really didn't, didn't um, 
make the impact that it, it maybe should have had. Now, the African Union has stepped into this conversation about when the elections take place and whether or not there should be a dialogue by designating earlier this year an AU special envoy to the DRC in, 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 the, in, in the person of Edem Kojo. Um, he has traveled to the DRC once already. Um, a number of um, the, a, the, the opposition groupings refused to meet with him because they simply reject the idea that a dialogue is necessary. As I said earlier, for them, the timeline is the timeline. Elections have to take place within a constitutional time frame. Um, there is movement on that within the political opposition. But I think a key, a key error, um, if, I, if I may put it that way, of, of, of Kojo's was to not declare upon arrival that he was not holding the dialogue that had been initiated by the government, but that he was looking at the situ political situation in the country neutrally, objectively, and evaluating it, and then and would then perhaps propose some of the solutions. The sense that the uh, that the opposition has is that Kojo is there to take the process initiated by the government forward. So, in other words, it's a rubber rubber stamping of a government staged, managed government dialogue. And that, of course, has put off the political opposition and civil society groupings. So it's kind of a non-starter now. Um, and we are turning around in circles on these two key issues. Should there be a dialogue? Shouldn't there be a dialogue? If there is a dialogue, it cannot be managed by the government. Can Koju recapture credibility? Um, can he be a good mediator? And if, if, he, if he is that person, what does he need to do to establish his independence? And so some of those are, those are some of the, the, the key questions. Um, let me just check time. Um, I think I've almost reached 15 minutes, so I don't want to go on for much longer. I think some of the recommendations I would make um, is that in, in terms of Kojo, since I was ended on that note, is that he needs to make a very strong statement with African Union support that the dialogue has nothing to do with the initiative made by the government. The dialogue needs to take place between political parties. The president has no role to play there. Prime Minister has no role to play there. It is a dialogue among political parties about the electoral, I don't want to call it a crisis, about, but about the elections. Um, it shouldn't be on the table immediately that, or other words, on, on the agenda that, you know, that we will have a delay or we won't. That should be one of the agenda items. How do we, you know, how, what is the calendar? How do we go forward? So I think that he needs to make a very strong break with the Congolese government, establish his independence, and create confidence with the opposition, um, which, which isn't yet, yet the case. Um, with regards to other actors in the international community, I think that other countries, um, whether together or alone, can make a very clear comment on the technical aspects of the election at this point, in particular this proposed 18-month period for voter registration. Um, that is very untested. Since that idea was put in the public space, there has been no commentary from many of the of the special envoys, with the exception of the American special envoy, and it has been de facto accepted as fact that this 18-month period should, should be respected. Um, I don't think that that should be allowed to, I don't think that's the right approach. I think that you can challenge that 18-month period. You can make a very productive uh, recommendation about perhaps supporting um, an acceleration of the voter process financially, about finding a, a group, you know, a, a technical group that can conduct that voter registration in a shorter time frame. And I think that that message needs to be sent because otherwise it looks as though there's approval. Um, and I think that in particular for the Congolese population, that is a really bad message. Um, people are very aware of this issue, whether or not they, they want to stay at home um, to, to support the opposition or not, everyone is aware of this question of when the elections will take place. And for the international community not to comment on the key element that indicates very clearly that there will be a delay, I think is a, is a mistake. Um, so I, I would argue that that's something that can still be remedied and that is a, a technical intervention coupled with an offer of support, I think would be a constructive way of, of, of perhaps going about it. Um, so I'll leave it there. I won't go into any of the details about the pop, the personalities involved and, and some of the other issues. I'll leave that for the question and answer period. Um, so thank you very much uh, for attending today's uh, briefing, and I hope you have, have questions. Thank you. With regards to um, African countries, I don't. I, I really can't comment on Nigeria's view on DRC, but I can comment on South Africa's view. And South Africa is a key player in the DRC, and there's no doubt about that. With Angola, I would say they are the two most important um, countries in the context of the DRC, um, and in particular in the context of these, these elections. Um, 
we we haven't seen any statements, any any official statements from the South African government on the question of the elections, but I get the sense that they recognize the difficulties of this situation, um, and that they understand that Kabila trying to extend his mandate would lead to greater instability um, in the country. Um, how they will handle that, of course, is anybody's guess. It's a diplomatic question. I think South Africa prefers to work behind the scenes on this one, much like other countries like France, for example, rather than coming out vocally and applying pressure. Um, South Africa has a number of, of different key interests in the DRC. Inga Dam, of course, is a key one. And the Inga Dam will suffer from instability because this is a massively capital-intensive project building a dam. It's also time consuming. Um, so there's an interest in maintaining stability in Kinshasa if South Africa wants to see that project go forward and get the international capital it needs. There are other interests, notably the Force Intervention Brigade, um, which you know is a big investment South Africa has made in peacekeeping and peace enforcement in DRC. It's not directly related to elections, but when you have a president clinging to power and you're trying to bring peace to another part of the country, I mean, those are not ideal. Uh, that's not an ideal situation. So there's there's that element too. I think um, Angola similarly it works a lot more behind the scenes than South Africa does. Um, they, I think, would be very um, unhappy about large scale instability in Kinshasa in particular. Um, they're facing a very difficult time at the moment as well and would not like to see a large African city erupt in protests that are extended for days and days and days because it gives people ideas, much like um, there's a there's a bit of an allergy in Congo about Burkina, about the events there. Um, so that that is a very real dynamic. It, it's not just uh, it's yeah, it's a very real dynamic. I, uh, um, you know, I, I, my view is that this will cause greater instability. It's hard to say at this point what the level of that instability will be, but I think it will be a combination of popular protests, retaliation by security forces. But I think that in certain parts of the country, and I'm not speaking about the East, I'm speaking more about areas like Katanga, there is also a potential for it to reawaken a number of the, the, the Mai Mai groups and other groups that have been active in, in, in Katanga. And the Katanga dynamic is a particular one. And of course, Katanga has a massive border with Angola. Um, so instability in Katanga could mean instability in, in Angola. And I would, I would put that on the pile of things that would uh, would, would induce Angola perhaps to try and convince Kabila to leave. Um, but those are the those are the, the the influential countries there. Now, with regards to the refugee pop the diaspora population in South Africa, well, in the past the diaspora diaspora population has been supportive of the opposition, um, more supportive of the opposition than of the president. We've seen a lot of um, unfortunate events here in South Africa where there were attacks on the Congolese embassy. Obviously, we hope to avoid that, but um, the, the, the trend in the diaspora is very much against uh, the government. And you have to remember these are people who left their country and moved somewhere else because the economic conditions at home were not great or because they themselves were political activists. Um, and so they, they, have, um, they have their own views on why they fled their country to a third, you know, another place under, under duress. Um, it's hard to say. Um, there is a lot of talk about potential successors and there is a lot of talk about the fact that one of the reasons there is a delay is that Kabila hasn't found a successor he can trust and feels comfortable with. Um, while I was in Kinshasa, an increasing number of people spoke about um, Kabila's wife potentially being his successor, Olive Lembe, possibly even his sister. Um, I think that those are very difficult uh, choices to make. There is a big camp of people who thought they might be the successor and who have been positioning themselves for that and who won't be very happy if they're not chosen. And those splits within the, 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 the ruling alliance are, I wouldn't say visible, but they're, they're, they're there um, and they are dangerous uh, for the ruling alliance. Um, so I think we will eventually see a successor, but I, I really can't tell you when. Um, the idea of changing the constitution for another mandate, I mean, you know, it's really, in order to do that, you have to submit the constitution to a referendum or that clause of the constitution to a referendum. Now, given the political climate at the moment and given also the financial situation of the country, holding a referendum is much like holding an election. It's no different um, in terms of logistics involved. So it's a tall order. It's not a magic wand. Um, and you're not necessarily guaranteed to get the outcome you like. Um, uh, so it is a risky, a riskier endeavor than simply orchestrating, you know, extra time in office by delaying, delaying, delaying. I did hear for the very first time 
a new argument, which is similar to the one in um, in, uh, in Congo Brazzaville, which is that the country needs a whole new constitution uh, because the current constitution, although adopted by a national referendum, was in fact elaborated by the transition government of non-elected officials. Now that's a that's a real that's a real can of worms, I would say. I'm sure that um, lawyers have a lot to say about that. But that is that is something I did here. I can't tell you whether that's a widespread view. I don't think it is, um, but but we'll have to see. So. Well, I think the Congo is ready for elections. This is the third round of elections, this third national elections they would have since the end of the, the war. Um, and, you know, the, the, the election outcome in 2011 was heavily contested um, and there were boycotts by a number of parties say who didn't take up their seats in parliament so i'm not saying it would be smoother that everybody would accept necessarily the result now would they not accept it because the election wasn't transparent and wasn't considered to be free and fair or would they not accept it because they didn't win it um, i think that those are two different questions um, I, I do want to say as well that i i you know I, whether we have elections this year and, and whether Kabila stands again is a very separate question from whether or not the elections we eventually have are quality, legitimate, credible, transparent elections. Um, even if we get to the point where we have finally have a date that everybody agrees on, we still have to have the actual election. Um, and that election has to be credible. Um, if it lacks credibility, it's going to replunge the country into an even bigger crisis than what we're seeing now. So um, that, is, that is really important. Um, and of course, that is also a question of political will. Um, I can't, I can't anticipate now what those will look like. I think there are too many other things we we have to see, how uh, evaluate how they happen, um, how the government handles the current situation before we can even speculate on whether the, the eventual elections might be free and fair. Um, Um, so for those who don't know who Moise Katumbi is, I mean, I doubt that there are many of you who are listening, but he is the former governor of Katanga province. Um, he resigned from that position last year. Um, when he was governor of Katanga province, he was a member of the ruling alliance, so a member of the, of the presidential alliance. Um, he has many hats, uh, among them a uh, very wealthy businessman as having made money in the mining industry. Um, he also owns the Congo's best and arguably one of Africa's best soccer teams, uh, which allow, has allowed him to, to gain uh, national recognition in the DRC, much more so than I would argue many of the other uh, opposition politicians. Um, he was a close ally of Kabila's. He has a bit of a difficult past, having been forced to leave Zambia on corruption charges. When he returned to the country, the deal was that he would give his political support to Kabila in return for him being allowed to, to operate as a businessman. Now, that relationship is clearly... Uh, um, soured, um, and Luis Katumbi has aligned himself with um, with the with the opposition. Although he hasn't made it clear that he it, he hasn't joined a political party at this point, um, he is popular. He is well known. He has a lot of qualities that the opposition leaders don't have. One of them is, is lots of money. Um, the other is the vehicle of a of a of a of a of, a, of, a, of his soccer team, um, and you know. Um, more so than some of the other opposition leaders like Martin Fayulu, um, he has uh, experience in government. Is he the ideal candidate? I mean, again, that's not really for me to decide. Um, I think that there is a sense in the political opposition that he's a latecomer, that um, he's kind of a, a bit of a rock star um, in, in, in the field. Um, and there, there is noticeably some resentment to his, his sort of stardom and the fact that people tend to talk about him a lot and to talk about him a lot more than they talk about people like Vital Camere, who um, became an opposition leader in 2009 after being president of the, the National Assembly and disagreeing with the president over the arrival of Rwandan troops in eastern DRC. So, you know, there, there, it's, it, if it came down to having one opposition leader, that would, there would be, have to be a lot of assumptions between now and then that there would be an umbrella grouping of one uh, of all the opposition parties and that they would agree on an opposition, one opposition candidate. I'm not convinced that it will be Muiz Katumbi, that they will that they will designate him. If he were designated, he wouldn't be a bad candidate. Um, I don't know how he would lead. Um, you know, the, the, the thing is that both Vital and Muiz Katumbi have, have a challenge, which is that there is there is distrust about their sincerity. Having worked with Kabila, um, 
in the past, some people simply say, we can't trust them. They're just doing this to lead us astray and they'll actually lead them, uh, um, rejoin the presidential camp once they've, once they've achieved what they want. I, I, can't, I can't speak to that, I, 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 whether that's true or not, but that is, that is one of the criticisms. Um, and it, it, it really speaks to a larger question about a lack of trust in, in Congolese politicians in general, um, many of whom have proven to be more avaricious and than, than necessarily um, working in the interest of the Congolese population. So um, I think that's a, it's a, it's, it's a fair uh, fear uh, given the history of, of, of some Congolese leaders. And that brings us to the end of this briefing. Thank you all very much for your excellent questions um, and for attending. And we'll, we'll continue to follow the DRC very, very closely over the, the next few months. So we'll, we'll be speaking with you again. Thank you very much.